Hi. Open your Bibles up to Titus chapter 1. I'd like to look with you uh, this first lesson over the first four uh, verses in the first chapter, which covers our first lesson. I also would like for you to mark, if you would be willing, uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. I want to look with you at verses 24 through 27, uh, just as a reference point. Uh, our first lesson is basically going to cover the introduction uh, to the book, which is the opening remarks that Paul makes to Titus. And again, that's in the first four verses. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Whatever translation you have will be fine and appropriate, although I would suggest uh, that you would have available at least one copy uh, of an NIV uh, amongst your group that you can refer to. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, this is how it reads. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and at his appointed season he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. Of course, the uh, book that we call Titus in our New Testament is actually a letter that's written from Paul to Titus. Uh, Paul, who wrote the uh, majority of our New Testament, has several letters uh, addressed to churches, both churches and people. Titus is unique among some of the other uh, letters that Paul wrote. Uh, he is in line with, or at least this letter, is similar to uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. We call them pastoral epistles. They're not written to churches, but they're written to specific people who are in charge of specific churches. Uh, Titus is in uh, Crete on Paul's fourth missionary journey. He took four, and we have actually records uh, for the first three. We really don't have a record of the fourth one. But on his fourth missionary journey, we gather that he had an uh, extended ministry in the islands of Crete. What Paul would do is, of course, as a missionary in the early church, he would travel uh, from place to place and have extended ministries uh, in each place in which he went, whether that would be Ephesus or Philippi or Thessalonica or Corinth. He would travel to these places and normally immediately go straight to a synagogue and present the gospel there. Oftentimes they would kick him out of the synagogue, uh, sometimes there would be a little bit more aggressive actions that would be taken. But uh, after presenting the gospel at the local synagogue, he would uh, then most of the time be expelled from the synagogue and would establish, nonetheless, in that area, uh, a church or a body of, uh, of believers, converts from his ministry. In each place, he would stay in a varying amount of time. Sometimes it would be uh, just a few short months. Sometimes it would be... A longer stay. But nonetheless, what would happen is he would go into an area and his ministry would begin and he would uh, present the gospel and it was always associated in Paul's ministry with phenomenal miracles and just uh, powerful teaching and preaching times. Um, extraordinary things took place in Paul's ministry. After being there for a time, he would leave and then again go to the next place of ministry. Now, the letters that we have in our New Testament are letters written by Paul back to the places he's been. So, for instance, let's say the first place that we're looking at here is his ministry in Ephesus. He leaves Ephesus, which you, you can read about the, the beginning of that ministry in the book of Acts chapter 19. But he, would, he began there, and then he would leave there. And, of course, leaving Ephesus, he ended up going to Rome. And he writes back the letter of Ephesians to the church here in Ephesus. And so that's where we have our letters uh, in our New Testament. Now, where Titus is, is in Crete. And in Crete, there's a several, we gather from scholars, that there were several islands there. And there was actually probably a number of churches among those islands. And Paul is writing back to Titus in which he left at Crete once he left. So he was at the ministry, uh, of course, in Crete, left Crete, and then writes back to Titus this letter. And the first four verses are the introduction of that letter. Now, we really want to break up these first four verses uh, in terms of... Uh, given an outline. It follows, as you've read at the beginning of your, your packets, 
your Bible study packets, the idea of saturation Bible study, uh, really heavily into that, uh, saturating into the scriptures. Um, there are three basic steps to each one of our studies and will be for each one of these lessons. Uh, the first step is asking the question, what do we see? It's approaching the text. We're not really drawing any conclusions. Uh, we're not doing really any in-depth study at this point. We're just gathering, walking through the passage, and uh, making some uh, overall observations of the text. The next step of Bible study, as you well know, is taking what we've seen and asking the question, what does it mean? This is where we try to come to grips with what the author is trying to say to us. Taking what we've observed and asking what that means. Not what it means to us, but what he meant it to mean. Okay, second step of Bible study. The last step of Bible study is after taking what we've seen, asking what it means, asking how that changes us. It's the application. Okay? So there's the observations of the text, there's the engaging of the text, and of course there's the application of the text in our life. What do, what do I see? What does it mean? What does it change? Okay? So the first step, what really what we want to do, is just do some basic observations of the text. And when we begin to go through the first four verses, we begin to see that there are four main divisions in the text. I kind of want to walk you through those uh, over the next 20 minutes, if I may. The first observation we really want to make, and we're just giving them titles, and you're free to give it your own title, really, when it comes down to it, but we're after concept. The first main division in the text is the idea that Paul is God's man. Okay. Paul is God's man. It's the first main division in the text. And we get that from the first verse, the opening statement that Paul makes. He introduces himself, which is very crucial. See, he could have introduced himself as the missionary. He could have introduced himself in terms of his uh, resume of ministry in Ephesus, Philippi, what have you. Uh, as, uh, however you would want to, to look at that. But Paul chooses to introduce himself as God's man. He belongs to God. He's in his service. In fact, he writes, Paul, first observation... He's a servant of God. You can also translate that slave. Paul is a servant of God. It's the first thing that he says. It's where he gets his identity. It's how he presents himself to Titus. And of course, Titus knows him very well. Paul, a servant of God. Second thing that he says. And an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, an apostle literally means the sent one or someone who's sent. Okay? Apostle and he's sent by Jesus Christ. Okay? This is the introduction that we have of Paul. Okay? He is a he's God's man, the servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So the opening statement that Paul makes is an introduction of himself. He's God's man. It's the first main division in our passage. The second main division is he's not only God's man, but it's, he's a part of God's ministry. There's purpose here. Okay? He's not just God's man, servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a part of God's ministry. And we know this because of the one word that's used after he introduces himself. After he introduces himself. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for. It's a conjunction that assigns purpose. Okay? Reason why. Hey, I'm a, I'm a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for this reason. And the reasons are two. The first reason, no doubt that you've seen, for the faith of God's elect. Okay? God's man, Paul, hey, servant of God, apostle of Jesus Christ, one who's sent by, the sent one, okay, for this reason. There's purpose, okay? It's a conjunction. It's purpose. Hey, this is why I'm a servant of God. This is why I have been sent by Jesus Christ, God's ministry. For, I've been sent for this reason, for the faith of God's elect, me, for the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of the truth. Okay? This is why he's been sent.
Okay? These are the first two observations or the breakdown of our passage. Of course, there's four. These are the first two. He is God's man and involved in God's ministry. He's God's man in terms of he's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, one who's sent by for God's ministry, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Uh, and of course, that's just, at this point, the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's the first observations. Normally, we would list them all, but the size of our marker board is small. <laughs> so we're just going to look at uh, two at a time. So we have listed what we've seen. Now we really want to ask what this means. And really, uh, want to just make some, some basic meaning observations. You'll be able to do more of this in your packets. But hey, God's man, Paul, he's a servant of God. He's a slave of God. His identity is found in him. He's not a servant of self. He's not into his own business. He's into God's business. He's a servant of God. He belongs to the Father. Okay? He belongs to God. And he's an apostle, one sent by Jesus Christ. So he's God's man. The identity that Paul gives himself to Titus, see how he presents himself, is he belongs to God. And of course, he's, he's being sent by. See, he's a servant of God for this reason uh, of God's ministry. Okay, which is the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, this is really important because the idea of faith, again, comes with, uh, we translate this word, uh, both faith and belief, and it carries with it the idea of salvation. When we're talking about the faith of God's elect, and the idea uh, of God's elect is God's chosen ones. And, of course, He has chosen us. Okay? He's chosen us. He's talking about those who are saved, and God has chosen you to be saved. So, the faith of God's elect... Uh, is the salvation of God's people. Okay? This is really powerful because he lists two reasons why he's sent by God. Okay? Two reasons why he's a servant and why he's been sent. One is faith of God's elect and the other is the knowledge of the truth. So Paul, put this together, Paul is not just sent for the faith. He's not just sent to get you saved. Okay? He's not just sent to create to present the gospel and to produce converts, get people into the kingdom in terms of salvation. They've been saved. They gave their heart to Jesus. Wham! Over with. There are two purposes in Paul's ministry. For the faith of God's elect, and then coupled with that is the knowledge of the truth. So it's not just about salvation. It's not just faith. See, he's also been sent for the knowledge of the truth. Now, we would probably talk about, or at least we could talk about, the knowledge of the truth in our day and time as discipleship what you might talk about it in your church. It's a discipling. It's a growing. It's a, it's a continued on in the, uh, in the journey of being a Christian. Of course, we are saved and we give our life to Jesus and we begin to live for Him and our identity has changed and He's done things in us that we can't do ourselves. That's salvation. That's the faith of God's elect. The concept that Paul is presenting. But coupled with that, and it, see, it doesn't end here. See, coupled with that is the knowledge of the truth. Now, it's really interesting, as we begin to expound on this just a little bit, and Paul does this for us, is this is a knowledge of, uh, this is a faith and knowledge. Listen to how he writes in verse 2. Okay? Verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for this reason, okay, the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, then he writes this, that leads to godliness. Okay? See, the knowledge of the truth, of course, leads to godliness. Uh, uh, which is powerful because the idea is, it's not just salvation that leads me to godly living. It's the knowledge of the truth that teaches me to live godly. Of course, I'm saved and I belong with him, but then he couples with it a knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And then he brings them both together and says, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. eternal life. And he also, of course, adds with that the idea of hope. I want to talk to you about both of these things really quickly. Okay? God's, minister, uh, God's ministry, which is being ushered through Paul. Okay? Hey, he belong, his identity is found in him. Paul has not come on his own agenda for his own thing. He's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for this reason, for the faith of God's elect, the salvation of God's people, hey, to, to present the gospel and converts, God's chosen them, and he's going there and preaching the good, the, the good news of the, uh, of the new covenant, and of course, there are uh, converts and those who are saved, salvation, the faith of God's elect. Now, he couples with that a knowledge of the truth, and then he tacks on the end of the knowledge of the truth, uh, 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 a, a leading to godliness, a, a lifestyle of godly living. It's not just salvation that he's after. It's a knowledge of the truth that's coupled along with that that produces a godly life. And it's those two things, 
that are going to bring us into eternal life, which is salvation. It's, it's the going to heaven idea that we might be familiar with. It's the going to be with Him. It's, it's after we're dead here on earth and we go into the eternal plan that God has for us, we call that eternal life. It's, the, it's a quality of life that is defined by Him. It's what we Christians hope for. Of course, also what the Jews hope for. But what's interesting is, and this is powerful, is Paul takes both of these right here, A and B, okay? Both aspects of his ministry. It's not just one aspect, it's both aspects. He takes both of those, you need both of them and need it in order to have eternal life. Because both of these are resting on the hope of eternal life. And when we talk about hope, it's not uh, hope in terms of... Um, like, uh, I hope that uh, so-and-so asks me to go out on Friday. Or, uh, hey, I hope that the Pacers win uh, when they're playing the Pistons, which is pretty much a sure thing. But it's, it's not like, well, I hope that my car doesn't break down. It's, it's a wishful thinking. It's a, it's a, there's chance involved. Not that kind of a thing. See, it, it's a hope. The idea of hope is it's an expected end. It's something that's counted on. It's something that's been foretold by God that's coming to me. I, hey, I, I'm putting my faith and knowledge in that. You understand? I'm, I, I'm counting on that. It's a hope to eternal life. So it's not a wishful thinking type of thing. It's a guaranteed thing that's coming toward me, promised by God. Okay? So both of these, resting on that eternal life, resting on the hope of eternal life. In other words, it takes both of these to get to heaven. It's not just, I come to an altar. This is powerful. It's not just I come to an altar, I give my life to Him. It's I come to an altar and hey, yes, I'm saved. And uh, yes, there's, a, there's something that takes place in my life, whether at an altar or wherever you would be. But something takes place in my life that He, he does things in me that I can't do myself. I'm, my identity has changed. I've been born again, as John would tell us. Salvation. And then coupled along with that is a lifestyle of the knowledge of who He is as truth. And of course, He is the truth. So it's a knowledge of who he is. It's a lifestyle of discipleship. It's a lifestyle of learning to live a godly life. So coupled with the idea of salvation is the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. And it's both of those. See, it's both of those that are going to bring me into eternal life, which is powerful. Okay? First two aspects. What we want to do, and I trust that you've written these down, is we want to look at the last two aspects. Again, there are four aspects to our passage. The first four verses... The third aspect to the first four verses is the idea of God's initiative. God's initiative. Okay? Now we see this in the passage, which is really powerful. Uh, beginning at verse 2. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which, okay, God, okay, this deal is brought about by God, which God, Paul doesn't say which I came up with, okay, which I really thought was important, see, it wasn't that kind of a thing, see, he is God's man, you notice that as you begin to go through these first four verses, Paul makes it very clear that it's all about him, wouldn't that be something if that's the identity of our own life, if everything going on inside of us was a result of him, if every situation we came into is in it, and we introduced ourselves as belonging to Him, our whole identity was all about Him. <sighs> Four aspects. First aspect, Paul belongs to God, God's man. Second aspect, doesn't only belong to God, it's sent by God, but he's doing God's work. It's God's ministry, the fourth aspect. The third, the third aspect is that God initiated this whole thing. See, God brought about this whole thing. He says, a, uh, verse 2, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God... Who, and he gives content to God. It's really powerful. Who does not lie. And of course, he's already really addressed this in that he is truth. God is truth. Does not lie. God is truth. Okay? Giving you a little bit of identity about him. God's initiative who does not lie. Hey, God pulls this off. He does not lie. And everything that goes on beyond this, you see, it is a statement that said God does not lie and this is what he's doing. He says, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. It's our first aspect. Okay? Promised before, and of course, the beginning of time. 
Okay, This was God's initiative. All that's taking place in Paul's ministry, all that's going on in his life, everything that he's about to spill out to Titus is all initiated by God. It was pro promised before the beginning of time. I told you to mark Ezekiel chapter 36, verses uh, 24 through, I think it's 27. You can follow along with me. Powerful, powerful. Again, this isn't before the beginning of time. This is mid-stride throughout the Old Testament. But see, God's talking about in Ezekiel 36 what He's doing presently in Paul's ministry, which is powerful. Listen to this, starting at verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Talking about what He's going to do. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. There's going to be newness going on in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now listen to this. And I will put my spirit, big S, I will put my spirit in you and cause you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Which is all about what Paul explains in all of his letters. He doesn't do so in Titus, but see, he's writing to Titus, and Titus knows Paul's theology, he knows Paul's philosophy of ministry, he knows Paul's fundamental belief system, so he doesn't really have to state it for Titus. If you really want to know the nuts and bolts of what Paul believes, you can go back and, and look through the Corinthian letters, and of Galatians and Ephesians, which are powerful letters, and you can get an idea as he writes to the church a little bit of his, a little bit of his doctrine. Romans is powerful too. Titus, he doesn't have to do that because Titus already knows that, so he alludes to it. Okay? But all that, all that Paul is experiencing, see, all that Paul is writing, is, it, is being, it, it was talked about, see, before the beginning of time, and we looked at just a reference of that in Ezekiel. Okay? So God's initiative talked about before the beginning of time. B, the next aspect is, beginning at verse 2, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and at His appointed season. Okay? In other words, hey, He not only promised it before the beginning of time, but in His appointed season, at a specific time, when God di dictated it, it took place. There's a third one. And at his appointed season, brought, this is powerful, brought his word to light. Now, Paul couples on the end of this, if you notice, brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. So, hey, coupled on to the end of this is this idea of Paul and Paul's preaching. But you understand, Paul's preaching, he doesn't even take for himself. Again, he's God's man, sent for God's purpose, in God's timing. And all that Paul is talking about, all of Paul's ministry, see, God is bringing the word to life. It's God that's speaking through Paul. It's God bringing about all that he's want to bring about, all he's wanted to bring about. So again, see, the third aspect, which is powerful, gives content, again, to the overall introduction of that Paul is giving. He's not just God's man. He's not just there on God's purposes. But see, all that he's doing in God's purpose is in God's timing that God talked about before the beginning of time. All that Paul is talking about, it's God bringing to light. It's God exposing. As Paul begins to speak, God takes the truth and brings it out and does what he wants to do with it. Okay? So there's, there's stages in this. God's initiative. Now the fourth part uh, is the address. The fourth part is to Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Okay, so this is the address, which is, of course, God's men. Okay, which, of course, we would address as Titus, which is Titus. Okay. To Titus, my true son, and our common faith. And probably, we could probably not even talk about this in terms of God's men. We could talk about this in terms of God's family. 
And it's really interesting because Paul and Titus, of course Titus is not his son, but there's something going on in terms of the kingdom that's so powerful that when you get caught up in God's ministry and what he's doing for his purposes, that it's family. He addresses him to Titus, my true son in our common faith. So the, the father-son relationship that Paul and Titus share is a direct result of their common faith, which is what's, uh, bring, uh, of course, what's bringing them together um, uh, in the focus of what they're doing. Now, he ends it with saying, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. It's a powerful first, vo uh, first four verses. would like you to discuss this together and uh, uh, really encourage you to uh, uh, bring to light some of your own observations in the text. Uh, go through your small group questions and uh, continue saturation.